Although it has sadly lived in the shadow of Mary Poppins, Bedknobs and Broomsticks is a fantastic and underrated film. At least it is in the restored cut. However, like most of Disney's adaptations of stories outside of fairy tales, many people don't know that it was originally based on a book, let alone two by Mary Norton, who would go on to write The Borrowers. Hello and welcome to Enchanted Essays. In this video, I will examine the primary differences between the 1971 Disney film, Bedknobs and Broomsticks, and the books that inspired it, The Magic Bedknob, or How to Become a Witch in 10 Easy Lessons, and Bonfires and Broomsticks, and assess whether or not these changes worked in favour of the film. For those of you who haven't seen the Disney film, let me give you a quick summary of the plot. The late great Angela Lansbury stars as Eglantine Price, a middle-aged spinster living in a small English village who was legally forced to take in three young evacuees from Blitz London during World War II. Although she tries to keep the secret from them, they soon find out that she is a witch and she offers to give them a spell in exchange for their silence the ability to transport themselves anywhere on an enchanted bed. When she discovers that her witchy open university course is no longer running, the children let her borrow the bed to track down her teacher in London, so that she can learn a spell that she believes will help with the war effort. Her teacher turns out to be merely a cheap musical act, Emilius Brown, played by David Tomlinson, who sold some spells he found in some old book, half of which is missing. With his help, they track down the book and use it to find the magic words, which cause inanimate objects to move. When the Nazis invade and use her home as a base, she uses the spell to attack them with old weapons and suits of armour from a local museum, sending them running with their tails between their legs. Although it always lived in the shadow of director Robert Stevenson's other live-action Disney films, and flopped when its butchered theatrical cut was originally released, it eventually became a cult classic. Now, on with the books! Probably the first difference that readers will notice is that the Rawlins children don't stay with Miss Price's evacuees, but instead meet her when they stay with an aunt during the summer holidays as their single mother is too busy with her job to look after them. The book opens with the children finding Eglantine with a broken ankle in their garden as they go out early one morning to pick mushrooms. Paul blurts out that she was practicing on her broom, as he had been watching her for the past few nights, but he hadn't told the others because she wanted to wait until Miss Price was better at it. This is comparable to other children's fantasy books, such as The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, in which the youngest children, who are most in touch with their imagination, are the ones who discover the magic. Miss Price bursts into tears and is scared that her secret has been revealed, but Carrie and Charlie promise to keep her secret. This is of course similar to the circumstances in which the children discover Miss Price's powers in the original whilst they run away, but they chose to confront her about it the next morning so that they could blackmail her. They offer her peaches on behalf of their aunt so that they can visit her. They find out more about Miss Price and her magic. After talking about it for a while and turning Paul into a little frog, unlike the white rabbit she turned people into in the film, Miss Price starts to realise that she may have to dispose of the children. Eglantine originally hinted at this in one of the Sherman Brothers' deleted songs. Thankfully, the children suggest that she gives them a magic spell instead that would stop working if they ever told on her. And so Miss Price enchants the bed knob Paul had taken off his bed and put in his pocket. One major difference from the film is that, if the knob is turned the other way, the bed can also travel through time. I can't believe people are stretching the fan theory that Mary Poppins is a Time Lord, but no one is saying this about Eglantine Price. Hashtag Eglantine Lord. Anyway, the kids test it out one night, but it doesn't work. They take it back to Miss Price, who tests the bed knob in her workshop, in a scene that plays out the same as the scene in which she first enchants the bed knob in the movie. She also shows the children her workroom, which in the book is far neater and more clinical than Eglantine's pile of notes in the film. Confounded, can't women ever learn to file things properly? There's also a stuffed alligator, which Miss Price admits doesn't actually serve much purpose and is mostly just there out of tradition. She then reveals that the bed knob only works when Paul uses it, as he does in the film. This continues the theme of young children having a greater connection to magic than older children and adults. Although Charlie and Carrie try to persuade him that the ability to travel through time and space enables them to do far more, Paul is a typical six-year-old and wants to go home to see his mum. One night, they arrive at their home in London, only to find that their mother is out. A policeman soon stumbles upon them and doesn't believe them when they try to tell the truth, so he takes them to the station. 
Paul is actually surprised at how much he likes prison because they let him drink tea and he isn't allowed to drink tea at home. However, they escape on the bed after the police brings it into the garden the officer has been trying to cultivate at the back of the station. For their next trip, Kerry makes plans to go to an unexplored island in the South Seas and offers Miss Price the opportunity to join them. One night she sneaks through the window on her broomstick and they go to an island. However, their exploring and sunbathing were not spoiled by the animated talking animals like the ones of the island of Nabumbu in the film, but by cannibals. Needless to say, this has aged poorly, especially with the multiple ways in which Norton describes them as inhuman. There certainly was a growing awareness of these harmful stereotypes whilst the film was in production, as demonstrated in the 1967 adaptation of Dr. Doolittle, which replaced the stereotypical natives of their source material with a more sophisticated drive. Although the way in which they have become sophisticated as finding shipwrecked books from the West is in itself problematic. Even Disney themselves had already edited out these racist caricatures from Tantasia in 1969, as well as editing out an anti-Semitic stereotype from The Three Little Pigs in 1948. Replacing it with this Disney version of the Dr. Moreau story works well in terms of utilising the setting without causing offence. Anyway, Miss Price has this tense magic battle with the tribe's witch doctor over her broom before she finally flies herself and the children back to the bed, just as the tide comes in. They hastily take the bed back to the bedroom. Miss Price leaves just before the aunt's housekeeper, Elizabeth, discovers the soaked bed. The aunt doesn't believe them when they try to tell the truth and sends them back to London. The children say a rush goodbye to Miss Price, who vows never to use magic again, due to a conversation she had with Carrie earlier about using her magic to cheat in gardening competitions, which is probably the most believable thing in this book. I can 100% believe that an old lady living in a British village would do this if she had magic powers. This is similar to Miss Price giving up her magic at the end of the film, but instead it's about the fact that she doesn't have the appropriate disposition for witchcraft, which I think is a better justification, even though the war very clearly isn't over yet. The book ends with the forlorn children on the train as Paul reminds the others that he still has the bed knob. This is of course similar to the final line of the film where the children are forlorn after Mr. Brown leaves to fight. The second book opens with Charlie and Carrie reading the ad they placed in the newspaper for somewhere to stay during the summer holidays, as their aunt has conveniently been killed off between books, when they discover that Miss Price has a similar ad offering two children to stay with her. They are delighted and remind Paul of their adventures two years earlier, which is a handy way to recap the previous book, before telling their mother about it. They take the train down to meet her and stay at her house. She only has two bedrooms, so Paul sleeps on the sofa in her room. The children are disappointed to see that Miss Price has kept her word and given up magic, although Carrie and Charlie are a bit more understanding. Paul is still disappointed about the loss of the stuffed crocodile. She has replaced one hobby with another by making preserves, which is presumably what that meal scene in the extended cut is referencing. Charlie and Carrie soon discover that Miss Price has brought Paul's old bed from their aunt's house after her death. The next night, they are furious when they discover that Paul and Eglantine have used the bed without them, giving it a test run by going to the nearby village. The children eventually persuade Miss Price to let them go back in time. The children arrive in 1666, days before the Fire of London, where they stumble upon a necromancer called Emilius Jones. Jones had previously discovered on his master's deathbed that the magic his family spent all their money teaching him was actually fake condemning him to a lifetime of fraud. The children take him back to Miss Price's house, where they are in admiration of each other. Miss Price is fascinated by Emilius, because she thinks he is a professional necromancer, whilst Emilius is fascinated by Miss Price, because, you know, she can actually do magic. After a few days, the children return Emilius to his time. Miss Price spends days worrying about him, and they eventually return to 1666 to find him. It turns out that he has been blamed for the fire of London due to his disappearance and is about to be burned at the stake. Thankfully, Eglantine saves him using intersubstitutionary locomotion, a spell that can make inanimate clothes move as if someone is wearing them. Obviously, this is the same spell as the one used in the movie to fight the Nazis, but with a slightly different name. I guess the Sherman brothers thought it was two syllables too many to be the title of a song. It is also mentioned in passing a few chapters before, allowing it to reveal to be a good payoff. 
They return to much friendship, where Amelius remains in Charlie's room for several days in a state of shock. The children become worried as Miss Price seems much nicer to them than usual, and she makes mysterious phone calls and writes a lot of letters. Eglantine finally reveals that she will leave the present and move to the past with Amelius. The modern world is too much for him, and they plan on moving to Pepper and Jai, a nearby village together. After packing all of their things onto the bed, Eglantine and Amelius leave forever. As the children make their way through the empty house, they decide to go to the ruined cottage in Pepper and Jai they think they would have ended up living in. As Carrie pretends to have a vision of them, she is shocked to hear Eglantine's voice one last time, telling her to get out of the cabbage patch. Although the plot is very different, the film also ends with Eglantine and Amelius together, and the children have to say their farewell to Professor Brown as he goes off to do his bit and join the army. Although he does look a bit over the hill for it to be honest, he looks like he'd be better off in the home guard. This means that the film ends with a similar sentiment, although the film's ending is far more victorious than bittersweet. I suppose Eglantine doesn't have the right hateful disposition to fight the Nazis as a witch, but Amelius Brown is psychologically unhinged enough to unleash his bloodlust on fascists as a way of seeking revenge on those who ignored him on the street when he was selling his wares and the music hall owners who never gave him that top black bull spot he felt he deserved. Wait, this film was released in 1971. Was this all just a piece of pro-Vietnam war propaganda? One great change from the movie is the fact that they don't go anywhere in their pyjamas. I know they mostly use the bed at night, but I just kept thinking how impractical it was for these premeditated journeys. There's a few lines of dialogue that are lifted directly from the book, but it's mostly original dialogue. Poison dragon's liver. Poison dragon liver. You mean you poison the dragon or just the liver? Have you ever heard of a rich witch? In the film, Miss Price is a lone wolf who isn't really interested in those around her and is illegally obliged to take the children in, as was everyone in the countryside with a spare room at the time, to protect the children from the Blitz. I wish a video that said the book version of Miss Price isn't as cute and cuddly as she is in the film, but I don't think Langsbury's performance is. Although both are clearly respected by those in the village, Miss Price in the film comes across to nearly everyone as a strict and cold spinster whilst Miss Price in the books is seen by the village as a kind old lady who visits the elderly and teaches piano. She's certainly not a social butterfly, but she's not much of a hermit either. She actually says in the second book that she prefers the company of children and that she isn't used to the company of men. However, they both are more than what they seem. In the film, the children bring out Miss Price's hidden kindness, whilst in the book they discover a slightly more menacing side to her. That's not to say that either of the outward facing aspects of their personalities are fake. These are just the tips of the iceberg. Both Miss Price are complicated characters, it's just that the side of her personality people see is slightly reversed. Both versions of the character are forgetful, but she doesn't keep all of her key spells in a handy notebook. In the book, Miss Price says that her fatal flaw when it came to magic, aside from her age, is her inability to hate. The film was originally supposed to include this with a song called The Fundamental Element. I can rave and in most ways behave as a witch, but alas, what I lack to be great is the fundamental element, hate. Her character arc in the movie was originally about learning to hate, she found herself up against the most despicable people in modern history, but this was cut in the pre-production stage. I said, how would you feel about being turned into a nice white rabbit? The heat is swelling in you now. Give in to your anger. She's definitely described as being an older lady in the book, whilst Angela Lansbury was 46 at the time. However, she had been playing older women since her 30s, such as the original 1962 version of the Manchurian Candidate, in which she played the mother of a man played by someone who's only three years younger than her. I think she's not supposed to be quite as old as she is in the book, but maybe a little older than she really was. As for the aunt, she's a rather bland presence who doesn't make much of an impact. She's pretty much there to ask the children to go on errands to Miss Price's house until she sends the children away at the end of the first book when the bed arrives home soaking with water. Miss Price has a maid, uh, but she doesn't really do anything. The aunt's housemaid, Elizabeth, leaves when she finds the soaking bed. As I said before, Norton cuts out the middleman by killing off the aunt between the two books, seemingly so that the reader can focus on the children and Miss Price. 
The main thing that fans of the film will notice is the presence of a mother. In the restored cut of the film, it establishes that the children are not only evacuees, but are also orphans who, until recently, had been raised by an aunt who had just been killed in the Blitz. Paul is pretty much the same character, a sweet six-year-old boy who sometimes gets them into trouble with his naive outbursts. He's described as having a face of an angel, and I don't think their casting was that far off. Carrie is mostly the same too. She's the most responsible of the three and slightly maternal. The only real difference is that she's the eldest of the three children in the book instead of the middle child. Charlie is certainly the most different of the three. He doesn't make that much of an impression in the book. He's neither as naive as Paul, nor as responsible as Carrie. In the film, however, Charlie is a savvy and manipulative baby spiv. A witch she is, says you. Then let's use the old loaf, says I. Although I have seen that some people find this aspect of him irritating, I think there's something quite likeable about this shady spiv archetype, as demonstrated by the popularity of Del Boy from Only Fools and Horses. I don't know if this archetype is maybe seen as more lovable over here. This film came out a few years after the successful British sitcom Dad's Army, which followed the home guard of a small seaside town with a likeable spiv in the form of Joe Walker, who was always able to legally sell goods that were rationed. I'm not sure if this characterisation or the inclusion of a similarly incompetent home guard were necessarily inspired by the show, but it may well have been something that the writers, the Shermans or the director, who is himself British, encountered during their research. Not only is this version of the character more memorable and entertaining, but he helps move the plot along. Although the children plan on running away to London, Charlie persuades the others to blackmail Miss Price. It's also the similarity to Mr Brown that gives them such a strong bond, contributing to the heart of the film, much like O'Malley and Toulouse in The Aristocats. Charlie is also cynical of Miss Price's powers, even after he has been turned into a rabbit. He is the eldest in the film, this is what prompts the song The Age of Not Believing. Although at first I thought this didn't really play into the story thematically after this scene, it was only after reading the book that I realised that both versions of the story have antagonists that don't believe the magical truth. This aspect of the character emphasises this theme and makes it more personal by making it a flaw of one of the self-insert characters as he faces adolescence, rather than making this cynicism exclusive to adults. As I said before, Emilius is in the second book, but he's a far cry from David Tomlinson's sly showman. Instead, he's a necromancer from 1666 called Amelius Jones, who has been unwillingly condemned to a life of conning people for a living. We have the typical confusion over modern technology as he and Miss Price get to know each other. At first, I did wonder if this was changed in the film to differentiate itself from the British children's show Cat Weasel, which had the similar premise of a magician from centuries ago arriving in modern England, but this only came out a year before, so I think this may have just been a coincidence. It probably would have been more difficult to fit this version of the character into the story of the film. In the film, Emilius is a charming showman and runs a correspondence college of witchcraft in which Miss Price is studying. Miss Price uses the bed in order to find him to get the spell that she is withholding from the course, which she believes she can use to defeat the Nazis. Similarly, Emilius is surprised that magic is actually real, as he had been flogging the course's spells from an old book he found in a market. Unlike the character from the book, he openly admits to customers in the street that his magic is just tricks, in order to sell them off in the extended cut with the song, Do It With The Flair. I'm a fraud, a hoax, a charlatan, a joke, but they love me everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer you my entire stock of magic. No, ladies, please don't go. The prices are so low, you will never cease to marvel at them. This gives us the impression that maybe he's giving up his career as a magician. He is also squatting in a mansion that has been abandoned by its owners after an unexploded bomb landed outside. This gives us the impression that, despite how he presents himself, thinks very little of his own safety and is even lonelier than Miss Price. He even calls this bomb the greatest friend he ever had for letting him live like a king. A Nazi bomb! This guy clearly has some mental health issues bubbling underneath that sly exterior. Whilst the book version of Amelius does appear to be as confident in his abilities to others as David Tomlinson's version of the character was, the omniscient narrator shows us just how insecure he is. Whilst the film version openly admits that he is a fraud in order to sell his old equipment to others in desperate times, 
there is a subtext of sadness and instability about him that climaxes as he tries to return to England in order to avoid a relationship with Eglantine. This is where we finally get to hear the self-deprecating thoughts running through his head in the form of a voiceover. For once in your useless life, you really seem to have been needed. You're a failure, Amelius Brown. In the book, Amelius is only 35, but his years of anxiety have made him look much older. David Tomlinson was 54 at the time, but we can see in the behind the scenes footage of his recording session for Portobello Road that he had grey hair that he seemingly dyed for the movie, so presumably this means he's supposed to be playing a character that's closer to Eglantine's age. In the book, they stay in a fictional village called Much Frencham in Bedfordshire. Although the film never confirms which county Pepperingi is in, Bedfordshire is landlocked, whilst Pepperingi is clearly a seaside village. Its exteriors were filmed in Corfe, a small picturesque village a few minutes drive from the Dorset coast, famous for its castle ruins, which were the inspiration behind the ones on the island in the Famous Five series. Pepperingi is the name of a nearby village mentioned in the second book, where Amelia stayed as a child, and is a much quirkier name, so I see why they kept it. Although I originally thought this was also fictional, it now looks like it may be a real place, but there's very little information about it online. Whilst both books were written in the 40s, neither mentioned the war. I think it's possible that the evacuation inspired Norton's writing, but perhaps she didn't want to include current events in her book. As I said before, the children have to stay in the countryside during the holidays because their mother is doing a job of national importance. A lot of women entered the workforce, including jobs related to the war effort, during this time, so it may have been referencing that. Their father is never mentioned, which feels appropriate as most readers of the Magic Bedknob would have had fathers who were absent or dead due to the war and its aftermath. The movie, on the other hand, does use this setting and utilises the Nazis to establish stakes and conflict. In conclusion, I think that the film takes many elements from the books, such as the setting and the characters, but to something far more ambitious and cinematic with the premise and the themes. Although its plots can still feel episodic, Eglantine's motives are constant throughout, allowing it to feel far less random. As for the book itself, I'd certainly say it is worth a read for fans and newcomers alike. While some fans of the film may find the differences strange, the book is a good read in its own right. I genuinely chuckled a little at some of the comedy in it. Norton really understands how to write children's dialogue, especially for six-year-old Paul. As for whether or not it's a good read for young children, I would unfortunately advise against it purely due to the cannibal scene. I know these days, a lot of children around the world are being introduced to Polynesian culture via media like Moana, rather than dated stereotypes like these, but I think these things should only be read by children who are old enough to be educated about why these stereotypes are inappropriate, but can understand that they can still enjoy other things about the stories themselves. This way, they are less likely to apply this outdated fear of otherness to those they encounter in real life. Did I miss anything out? Have you read the book? Did you grow up with this film, or discover it as an adult? Which cut have you seen? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. If you want me to make more content like this, you can let me know by liking the video. I post video essays like this and obscure film reviews nearly every week, so be sure to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. If you want to watch more about this film, then I recommend the 20 minute featurette about the production and restoration in the extras section on Disney+, Plus, which I will link to in the description below. If this video gets 50 likes, I'll post another video in this movie in which I'll detail the ways in which the theatrical cut the version that is available on Disney Plus is vastly inferior to the director's cut that was reconstructed and released in the 90s, so be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon if you want to be the first to see it. Now, I'm off to start the theory that Eglantine Price is a Time Lord. If you want to see me analyse another Disney film, you can watch my video essay on Oliver and Company here. See you soon! What are you doing with that? He knows too much. Thank you. <laughs>